no human is right. No algorithm is 100% right. No indicator is 100% right. Like we, no one can predict what's going to happen in the future. People will argue that and say that. You know, I've had very amazing, accurate calls, but I'm not right all the time. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin is a, is a free market. Bitcoin is about making your own decisions, owning up to it, and being responsible for your actions. And when you're copying somebody else and then they get wrecked and you get wrecked, then what are you going to do? You're going to go blame it on them. Having confidence is the hardest thing to do for a lot of us, but you have to believe in yourself. Nobody else in this world is going to believe in you. Not even your mama sometimes. Heck, my, me and my mom bicker. So if you don't believe in yourself and you don't love yourself and you don't feel confident in your choices, who are you? Swissborg est sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the markets. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Crypto Wendy, the crypto Bitcoin mom, one of those cool personalities on Twitter, crypto YouTube, a trader, and tons of cool stuff for you today. And before we kick off, a shout out to Nate at Crypto Slate. You will find a summarized article of this interview in case you want to see a summary. And don't forget to stay with us until the very end because we're going to talk about tons of cool stuff trading crypto, fundamental analysis, technical analysis, cool coins, and more and more. So without further ado, Wendy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you guys and just hang out. I am so excited. I've heard so many good things about you, including uh, Scott Melker. Hello, Scott. Hope all is well on your side. And uh, yeah, I would love to kick off when you just getting to know you, you know, like what is your story? Who is Crypto Wendy? How do you fall in, in love with Bitcoin? What are some of the crazy trading experiences you've had? Anything you want to share with the community, go for it. So I don't necessarily know if this would be like a trading story, but it's more of an investment story. So probably the coolest, I've done a lot of cool things. I made a lot of money in crypto too. Not like a whole lot of money, but I'm doing okay for myself. Um, Cause I grew up poor from the lower middle class and I never thought that I would, you know, make this type of money or just be able to be an entrepreneur, be a business owner. I in Southern California, it's very hard to, you know, start and maintain a business, but I'm here, but probably the coolest story I have maybe from, I guess, investing Bitcoin was I took the money from my daughter daughter's savings account, the fiat I had in there. Um, I took it and I invested. I bought Bitcoin for her anywhere between, I want to say it was between three and $7,000 when we were at that price last year. But I'll even go further to say even under $10,000 just in case anyone wants to fact check me. And I went ahead and bought her Bitcoin and she's got she's got no fiat savings. She has 100% Bitcoin savings no. and her investment is up like four times. No way. That is so cool. So your daughter's savings is in Bitcoin, not even a little ratio of US dollar, just all Bitcoin. She no longer has a fiat savings account. Um, it's all it's in it's stored very safely somewhere. And it's all Bitcoin. And I'm sure she's probably got more Bitcoin than some other people. So I'm happy. I'm ha really happy for her in her future. And she's not going to be able to touch that until she's like 18. Um, and she can use it to whatever, whatever she wants. If she wants it for college, if she wants a car, if there's something she wants to pursue, we can discuss it. We can make a decision as a family together. Um, but she's, I would say her investment is doing pretty well, considering that that same savings account has a 0.01% um, return monthly or yearly or something ridiculous. Something ridiculous like that. And to be completely transparent, uh, I have the exact same situation with my daughter, Wendy. <laughs> All Bitcoin, no fiat. That's super cool. And that just leads me to that question of why Bitcoin? You know, what made you fall in love with Bitcoin? What makes you trust it to the point where you're willing to put 100% of your daughter's future assets into Bitcoin and not a fiat currency, for, for instance? 
Well, um, it took me a long time to really understand the importance of Bitcoin and for what it stands for and all that great stuff. And I really do believe that Bitcoin was created for the people by the people, whoever Satoshi is or whoever that group is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older than most people in crypto. And I remember 2008. I remember the housing market crash. I grew up in California, Southern California. A lot of people I know personally lost their homes. They lost their life savings, their businesses, everything due to that um, economic crash. And that's where Bitcoin was created out of, in my personal opinion. And I think that there needs to be a solution to kind of stop what the Fed is doing, stop what these big banks are doing with traditional finances, doing the government. I mean, one can argue that the government does have the people's best interest. But realistically, when you really look at it and you break it down and you look at the policies and where our tax dollars and whatnot go to. Heck, in California, they passed a bill that raised the taxes in California to 9% sales tax to supposedly fund like homelessness, stuff like that. But is all that money really going to stop homelessness? Because we still see camps everywhere. So just seeing things like that and me working as hard as I did, I, I worked minimum wage for a long time. I worked in healthcare seven years before crypto and just kind of seeing the way, like where my tax dollars and where my money is going. And it really didn't serve me because I always made I always made like a little bit more to where I couldn't qualify for any social programs ever. So I never mm. was on social programs. And it's like, really, like I can't afford to pay rent somewhere to rent an apartment by myself in Southern California, but then I don't call for government assistance. So how is that where like my tax money is going to the government, but the government is not helping me. So I always thought it was kind of weird. And then, you know, I've stumbled upon Bitcoin. I initially heard about it in 2011, 2012 from a family member. Then I started really getting into listen to libertarian radio back in like 2016, 2017. I was like, you know, I should probably just take the leap of faith and go ahead and do this. Um, even though I don't come from a technical background, I'm not very tech savvy. I'm not very math savvy. I wasn't brought up that way. And most, you know, for, um, I'm not going to speak for all women, but I'm going to speak for myself. A lot of like women I know feel the same way. They're like, oh, we don't want to do math. That's like for boys. But, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's it's true, though. Like, that's yeah, how that's yeah, how yeah. I brought up. I don't know any out of all my female friends. I don't know any of them who went to become STEM majors. The only time I met STEM majors yeah. was when I worked in pharmacy. Um, but other yeah. than that, I don't know any other female STEM majors like outside of that. So I just, you know, and that's one of the reasons why I believe in Bitcoin. It kind of forces us to really analyze what's going on, forces us to pay attention to personal finance to see what's going on with the governments, where our money is going. And, you know, something does have to be done. And I, you know, I'm vocal about things to an extent, but I also mm -hmm. I'm not one of those people that's going to be out on the street protesting because I am done with that kind of crazy life. I'm not interested in being out on the streets. I want to mm -hmm. be home safe with my family. I'm a mom. So the best way for me to go ahead and kind of fight the system is to peacefully protest and to buy Bitcoin in that aspect, you know, put my mm -hmm. money where my mouth is and also to teach my daughter, teach my family about financial literacy, about personal finance, about Bitcoin. And also, too, I'm, I've done over four dozen meetups globally um, and most most of them in the United States. And then I have some plans to do some to meetups at my local boxing gym talking about blockchain technology, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and kind of segue it into financial literacy um, for that demographic, because that town that I that city, very poor mm -hmm. city, I live there for five years and they need help. And if I can help somebody have a better quality of life, I'm there. So so just to track back a little bit, just to summarize what you're saying. So the re what made you really fall in love with Bitcoin was the fact that there was a ripple or there was like a consecutive events that made you lose trust in the government and the, in the system overall. And then you thought, OK, this trustless protocol uh, that we call Bitcoin was a solution to the problem that you were facing. Is that kind of like the summary of? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's you know, we get tired like, OK, this is the thing. I know some people get mad at me for saying this, and that's fine. Like, I understand that taxes are important because we've got to maintain roads. We've got to have clean water. We've got to provide for community. Like, so I get it in that aspect. But at the same time, too, I didn't feel that my tax dollars were actually going forward to towards that. Because again, I was working minimum wage in Los Angeles and I wasn't able to afford to rent an apartment, but I also wasn't able, wasn't able to qualify for government assistance at the same time. I'm not saying I would have mm -hmm. got on government assistance, but it just kind of didn't make sense to me because it's like, how mm -hmm. am I supposed to live? You guys are taking like 20, 30% of my paycheck and I've got to pay for insurance. I got to pay for all these things. I can't afford to live. But, you know, I, you, I'm paying you guys taxes and I'm not getting any of that tax money. Like that didn't make sense to me logically. Yeah. So, you know, I just kind of started being like, I'm going to opt out. I'm going to opt out. And it's really just kind of the best way to opt out without having to, to run amok in the street. In my personal <laughs> I would love to know, like, what are the lessons that you're going to teach to your children? And when it comes to personal finances, to me, like there's one thing that I wish, you know, we were 
com- that was compulsory in university was to read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad. I don't know if you had the chance to read that by Kiyosaki, uh, which really teaches simple assets versus liabilities and and how you need to make your money work for you to pay for your liabilities and the whole quadrant system. By the way, guys, for those who've never read Rich Dad Poor Dad, one of the best you know books to start with in terms of personal financing. But what are some of the hard learned lessons that you went through when it comes to managing money that you like to pass on to your children and future generations? So I was brought up very, very poor after my parents split up and then my dad ended up passing away a few years later. We went from having like a very, my dad was doing really, really well. We went from having like a four bedroom house. Um, Everything was very nice. We always had money um, to being in a two bedroom um, town home. My grandma and my aunt slept in one room, me and my mom and my two sisters slept in the other. So I went from having a four bedroom house to a two bedroom house and sharing a room with three other people. Um, my mom was always very financially conservative. So I was lucky that I was brought up around that, but my mom wasn't really like a risk taker when it came to stuff because she was, I feel like she was like just so scared and just was concerned about putting food on the table during that time. So I grew up very financially literate, but I just, you know, I kind of fell in a dark place when I was growing up because I was very rebellious, rebellious. I was wanted to be out mm. running amok, doing whatever. So, you know, I did rack up credit card debt and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but really, like what I want to teach my daughter, I want to teach her that it is OK. Like debt is bad. We don't want to use credit cards for things, whatnot. And I'm not here to judge anyone either. But at the same time, it's OK to take chances. It's OK to say, mm. you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to invest in this. And I'm so glad that I took that couple thousand dollars and I invested in Bitcoin because if I wouldn't have done that and it was on Coinbase too, and if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be here today. So sometimes it, you have to, you have to spend money to make money or to gain opportunity. And these opportunities and these networks are going to be able to fuel things later on. And that's one of the things that I will teach her is that, you know, make sure your, your, you know, your home life is good. your budgeted. Everything is good. But sometimes you do have to take a risk and it is okay to take a risk. And my, that's something my mom did not teach me. That makes a lot, a lot of sense. And I can resonate with you because I actually grew up with a single mom in one single bedroom for me and my brother and her, three people. So it was, we had some tough times and dark times as well. And I think you, that makes a lot of sense. Debt is is very, very dangerous um, unless, you know, you can control it in a shorter amount of time. So I think that's, and in the US, you know, consumerism, all this really pushes us to live paycheck to paycheck, which when I lived in on the other side of the planet in Japan, where people were extremely economical, right? They always try to save at least 20 to 30% every month. And so there are different cultures, I guess, different um, aspects, but then moving into your trader life. So I would love to ask you a really simple question because you just mentioned investing in Bitcoin. Like how much do you like to invest in just hold long term versus how much do you actually trade? Uh, I think a lot of people have this misconception of, you know, traders just trade everything. Right. And it's not necessarily yeah. true. It's usually a yeah. ratio. So. Um, yeah, can you no. enlighten us a little bit there? Yeah, <laughs> I'm different from a lot of other traders is because I'm more I'm more susceptible to risk because I am a mom and my yeah. risk. And one of the things I like to tell people is just because you see someone on Twitter posting something or somebody telling you something. Oh, I invested this much. This is what I do. Da, 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 that yeah. does not matter. They are not you. They don't have your background. They are not making what you're making. They don't have the same type of family as you. It's completely different. You do what works for you. You do what you're comfortable with. Don't let anybody tell you that um, or make you feel bad that you're not investing 100% of your paycheck. You do what makes you feel comfortable. Like, I don't know what kind of debt you have. I don't know what type of lifestyle you lead. I don't know what your goals and aspirations are. Do what makes you comfortable. Me personally, I have a very, very small amount of my portfolio that I actually do, I'm actively trading with. Um, And right now, because of the way the market is, I change when the markets change. When alts were not really doing anything too much, I was trading Bitcoin or trading Ethereum. But now since we're seeing more of an altcoin market, I'm focusing on that and continuing to accumulate Bitcoin and Ethereum. So really, I I change when the market changes. And I'm actually doing less work now and less trading and making more money than I was actually trading Bitcoin. So as far as your question goes, I'd probably say I trade like less than um, less than 10% of my portfolio, yeah. actually putting my money out there. And I'm just kind of using the rest of my portfolio and I'm letting it work for me. I'm setting it, putting it in places where I'm earning, you know, that APY back and whatnot, and just kind of holding on to my investment. And I'm glad I'm doing so because I'm actually making more money. I, was, I made more money just holding Bitcoin than actually trading it. So there's different components and there's different things that I like to do um, that work for me. However, if you're listening to this, this may not work for you. You may want to yeah. trade with more. Or you may want to trade with less. So again, you have to really sit down and analyze your situation and yeah. decide what works best for you and your family. That makes so much sense. I believe that most people do not take enough time to self-reflect and truly understand their risk appetite. 
Uh, so I think that's really, really good advice to better understand, you know, oneself before actually going through this adventure, right? And, and setting the right goals. I do have a question related to what you were saying. So, um, which is very fascinating, by the way, 10% is very interesting because we had a, an interview with Scott who said he would put not more than 20% um, in, in terms of trading and the rest was mostly hodling and maybe swing trading and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, when it comes to trading, obviously, we, we know there's fundamental analysis and there's also technical analysis. And for those watching out there, a technical analysis, usually we have two uh, categories. We have the charts and we have the technical indicators, so chartist and technical indicators. But before asking you a question related to that, um, in terms of fundamental analysis and technical analysis, do you actually use fundamentals as well for crypto or is it mainly TA because some people say that there's a lack of fundamental analysis? We'd love to hear your take on that, Wendy. It depends. It depends the market we're in. When we were in a bear market, fundamentals did not matter because there would be news coming out about Bitcoin. There would be news coming out about different cryptocurrency projects. I remember in 2017 when Bitcoin Cash was listed to Coinbase and it pumped it like it did like 40 or 50 percent it did something crazy i don't know what i just remember like oh my god and seeing it go up mm -hmm. so you have to you have to take into consideration what market you're in if you're in a bear market news is not going to really move price you might get like a 10 mm -hmm. to 20 percent pump but now when we hear about news it's causing 40 to 50 percent pumps or 100 percent pumps 200 percent pumps so it really depends and then also too ta works but for me personally ta has worked better for me in a bear market than a bull market because in a bull market there's so much fomo there's so many crazy things happening number goes up and mm -hmm. it just doesn't stop however uh, my technical analysis does help me when we're start when I can see a little bit of weakness on the chart, like I'm seeing we're starting to get a top. So it kind of just really depends what's going on because you know it could it shifts like that. that's why I do daily YouTube videos and I do daily updates because when the market changes, I change. And I if you're not paying attention to the market, then you could get wrecked. Yeah, that makes a lot a lot of sense. And in terms of the technicals itself, like obviously I'm sure you use like a combination of of charts and technical indicators. Like what are some of your go-tos or you know some of the tools that you use that you f really feel like, oh, this has helped me a lot in terms of timing my trades and this is something that I want to stick to. Obviously, I'm sure you're constantly evolving, Wendy, and always trying new things and stuff like that, but are there any go-tos in terms of technicals and chart patterns that that you find that are very, very helpful for your trading? For me, with altcoins, I really, really enjoy using the EMA 9, 21, 50, 100, and 200. It just, for me, it just works really, really, really well with all coins, except when we're going parabolic, because when you're going parabolic, you have no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> I'll cross the sure. on there too, just to kind of get a visual to help reaffirm. But I use a lot of support and resistance. And when I chart Bitcoin, it's really just a lot of support and resistance. And I'll use Market Cipher as well, which is a paid indicator by a good friend, my good friend, Crypto Face. And that also helps give me an edge too, because it helps measure the money flow index, money coming in and money going out. If money is leaving, you probably want to open a short because that means price is going to go down because there's no water that's going to the pond. And that's something, that's how he explains it. But when money's coming in, you might want to go ahead and open a long because, you know, number go up. So I use, there's different things that I do use. And again, I kind of analyze the market day by day because things are things move so fast in crypto and they change so it kind of really it really depends what i'm looking at and that, those are some of the tactics that i use sometimes i'll use that same ema schematics uh, for bitcoin however you know it really depends depends how i'm feeling that day too and that's why i journal all my stuff down that is super cool and so in terms of the emas is are you using the ribbons that that help you create some sort of ribbon pattern to show you the or you just throw in ema like nine you said 20 hundred etc on a chart and i don't use the ribbons i i just use the regular emas like the lines um because they act as really great support and resistance and when you get and you can also see when they're bull or bear crossing and a really great tactic that i've been using is the emas um, all those emas on the four hour chart because when what happens is, is when you get the emas stacked it's like a, i call it a bullish stack even though that's not the technical term but it makes sense to me i explain it to my audience that way but when you have the ema 9 21 50 100 and 200 all stacked that way stacked down that is bull, super super bullish and if you look at the four hour chart generally price will not drop below ema 200 and mm -hmm. right now what i'm noticing with a lot of alts a lot of altcoins are riding that ema 9 up and they're having pullbacks and they keep bouncing off of that ema 21 and sometimes they may get down to that ema 50 but for the most part they're staying in that area and on the mm -hmm. four hour chart you'll you'll see like a EMA tangle with the EMA 9, 21, 50, 100, and then EMA 200 at the bottom. And sometimes I'll use that as like a stop loss for myself. So it just kind of depends, kind of depends. No, but that's really, really useful. And you just mentioned another cool tip, which is the four hour chart. 
Uh, do you like the four hours? That one of your go tos as well at the moment in terms of understanding the the price fluctuations. Or obviously, I'm sure you zoom in, zoom out. But yeah, um, so it really depends what asset I'm looking at. So for example, Dogecoin, I like to take a look at the monthly chart because it's kind of t- it gives me an idea of what you know what previous price action is. I generally like to zoom out as far as I can to see the pattern because there's yeah. pa- each different project has different patterns, and yeah. I think that's amazing. But if you can master those patterns on different assets you can make money. So for Dogecoin, I like to use a monthly in scale. And for Bitcoin, it's generally the weekly, but I'll do like weekly, daily, four hour, one hour, 45 minute, 30 minute. And if I'm scalping, it's going to be um, five, 15 and 30 minute. So it really, really just depends like what my time frame is. Is it a swing trade? Is it a scalp? It is a long-term hold, just kind of stuff like that. Oh, actually, can you, can you quickly uh, imagine my grandma Susie was watching the show? What is a scalp? You know, that that's a, that's a term that I've heard. Actually, I've seen in some of the comments before from other videos people asking to explain what a scalp was or swing trade do you mind uh, sharing that with us in layman terms <laughs> okay i know crypto is different from traditional stocks and i may i explain things differently than other folks do because that's the way my mind processes it and that's okay if it makes sense to you explain it that way so when we're talking about scalps that is like you it's like it could be considered as a day trade depending on how long it is sometimes you're in and out in an hour 15 minutes five minutes two hours so it's more of like a short it's like you're in and out really fast but when we're swing trading it can, depends and crypto a swing trade could be like maybe 24 hours maybe three days maybe a week maybe a couple months it really yeah. depends what asset it is and how long it takes for the price to appreciate to that area that you want to go ahead and enter exit at um so kind it's you know scalp is short term short term time frame no longer than generally 24 hours a swing trade is generally to me generally 24 hours to however long it takes for your trade to go through very very well put and you just mentioned like chart patterns as well so you were talking about like bearish patterns and bullish patterns and you know and you also talked about comparing traditional finance with crypto and it's funny for example in terms of charts we have the the simpson chart in crypto which never really popped up in in uh traditional markets but uh are there are, obviously there's bull flags bear flags but um are there any other patterns that you find that are very accurate in crypto whether it be ascending triangle descending triangle head and shoulders triple top double top whatever are you are there any uh specific chart um uh, uh flows that that you like to find in, in when you're trading your crypto i'm not a big pattern trader because i forget all the time because my mind moves so fast sometimes I'm like, what is this? <laughs> so i'm not gonna lie i'm not a big pattern trader sometimes and like when i draw my trend lines and stuff they're not always accurate because it's i just don't want to do it that way um but like you know i try to be as accurate as possible like on my streams and stuff as i don't want to give the correct information if i do something incorrect i'm like guys this is not the right way to do it this is how windy does it don't copy me this is what i'm doing um but like i'll generally do like an ascending wedge or descending wedge because it's a pretty um, powerful reversal pattern at some times but as far as the bull and bear flags i'm not too really keen on those i just really like to you know see how price responds to support and resistance the support and resistance are emotional levels for people they're important yeah. areas that people bought and sold and buying and selling um is a very emotional transaction for a person and i think that we paying attention to others emotions can help give you an edge that makes a lot of sense and i think you know ascending triangles and descending triangles like you said to keep it simple like you go stick to the basics a lot of people tell tell me that those are the most commonly used chartist patterns for them as well so uh, uh that's very very cool and there's one question just came to my mind actually by the way guys uh crypto wendy has also a youtube channel and there's some really, really cool content there. And when I'm going through the content, there's there's one thing I want to ask you, which is uh, one of your videos is called Altcoin Season is Here. And, uh, you know, I would love to hear from you, like, how do you declare, like, when it's alt season or not? And, and I know there are different definitions for different people. People say when Bitcoin reaches six, 60% dominance and then drops to a certain level, different definitions. But what is what was for you, like... That time where you think, okay, now it's alt season. Now I'm going to play around a bit more and not just uh, hodl Bitcoin or, or trade Ethereum. So this is the thing. Alt season is kind of like a meme at this time because everybody says it. And like a lot of the YouTube, <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of the, for YouTube, you have to have clickbait titles or no one's going to watch your stuff. For a long time, I fought. I fought for like two years internally. Everyone's like, Wendy, you, if you want more views, you have to do clickbait. I'm like, I don't want to do clickbait. They're like, you have to. And like, so I finally started doing it. So some of my titles are really cringe. I hate it, but the actual content is still the same in there. It's still very straightforward. It's very like mm-hmm. non-biased. Um, we are definitely in like a mini alt season. Like we're seeing when people are making money, that's alt season. Um, the type of alt season we had in 20 or 2017 is going to be different than we're going to have in this season because there's a lot different, um, 
economically, there's a lot, we're at a diff, completely different time. So I just, again, like I just watch the market and I don't, I'm not a big, like, you know, this is going to 10 times, this is going to 20 times. I think it's yeah. kind of cringe, but at the same time too, like I want views just like everybody else. Um, so it just, I just, me personally, I like to watch the market every day. And so you, you just mentioned something, just going back to something you said earlier, you keep on saying, don't copy me and do So is it fair to say that copy trading is not something that you would recommend? You know, a lot of those apps have this copy trade I feature. I just, I don't like it. And the reason why I don't like it is because, yeah, you can make great money doing it, but no human is right. No algorithm is 100% right. No indicator is 100% right. Like we, no one can predict what's going to happen in the future. People will argue that and say that, you know, I've had very amazing, accurate calls, but I'm not right all the time. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin is a, is a free market. Bitcoin is about making your own decisions, owning up to it and being responsible for your actions. And when you're copying somebody else and then they get wrecked and you get wrecked, then what are you going to do? You're going to go blame it on them. You're going to want recourse. So that's why I'm like, listen to what I have to say. If it resonates with you, take what resonates with you and apply it to yourself, but don't do everything I say, because what happens if I make a mistake, then you're going to come back and be mad at me. Yeah. You have to believe in yourself. Having confidence is the hardest thing to do for a lot of us. But it's also the best thing I believe to do because you have to believe in yourself. Nobody else in this world is going to believe in you. Not even your mama sometimes. Heck, my, me and my mom bicker. So if you don't believe in yourself and you don't love yourself and you don't feel confident in your choices, who are you? Like, what are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. And to be very honest with you, you know, I had sometimes insider information, like very high quality coming from a very strong source. Uh, but simply, I just didn't like the project. I didn't like the coin. I didn't like the CEO who was in the project. And I didn't take the trade, Wendy. Believe it or not, I could have made easy 70, 80% in within, you know, uh, less than 24 hours. And I didn't take the trade because it just, for me, if it didn't actually happen, I would feel bad about myself, right? Because it's not something yeah. that I believe in. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you got to own it and you got to own yourself and you got to feel confident in doing it. And if you can't trust yourself, like, don't, no one else in the, no one care, like, People do kind things for other people, but realistically, everybody cares about their family. They want to eat. They Everybody else wants to eat too. So Absolutely. And you just mentioned the future, and that is the perfect transition for the, the last segment for today. Uh, talking about the future, you, you also mentioned something that I want to paraphrase, which was this bull market is different from the one in 2017. So just following up on what you said earlier, what exactly do you mean by different in this case? And by the way, many people are saying that it is definitely different, but uh, what does that mean to you? I'm very in touch with general population because again, I worked in healthcare seven years in infectious disease, I worked with all different types of demographics. You name a, you name a subgroup, I worked with them. I served them um, in healthcare. And I'm very in touch to what's going on, like in the real world. I feel like there's a lot of people in crypto that live in ivory towers. They got a lot of money. They forget where they came from or they never kind of had any type of struggle. So they're just like, oh, this and that. Da, 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 da. They have no idea what's going on with general population. They have no idea what's going on in other parts of the world. Um, we're in where I'm going to call it stupid 19 for S for SEO purposes. So we don't get pegged. But realistically, half the world is at home, at home. Things have kind of halted. Things have stopped. Um, personally, I think, I mean, again, I lived through 2008. I saw what, even, even though I was young, I lived through it. I saw what happened. I'm mm -hmm. looking at the housing market now. I'm looking at a lot of things. I'm looking at people not being able to pay their bills. I'm looking at people that can't put food on the table. I do, um, I do charity work for a domestic violence center in Los Angeles, California. And, you know, they have a lot of restrictions placed on them. Um, there's a lot, of, there's an insane amount of mental health cases popping up, drug abuse, all different kinds of stuff. I'm not trying to be negative, but yeah. it is what it is. And yeah. this market, we're in a completely different market. I feel like what's going on globally, it's kind of, it's kind of breaking. Like before there was like poor, lower middle, middle class, um, middle, upper class and rich. And now it's like poor and rich. There's really not too much more in the between middle yeah. classes getting hammered right now. And it's a di it's different. 2017, people had money. Money was flowing. People were able to buy things. But now some people might be hesitant as to what to buy when because they don't have freaking money and they're scared. Like, am I going to put my money in this and this is going to go and I can't pay my bills? Also, too, 2017, we didn't have billionaires and millionaires buying a lot of Bitcoin. We're seeing that now. And that's a little scary, too. It's like, are these people going to take this, you know, buy so much of the supply to where it gets manipulated? They're taking money from the OGs and they're, you know, controlling the supply. Like that's another thing to worry about too, because Bitcoin is a finite supply. 
Yeah. So the market is totally different than 2017. And as of right now, I still believe in Bitcoin. It's my way of a peaceful protest. But at the same time, I'm cautious as to what's going on. I'm paying attention to where people are putting their money. Like in 2017, I had, even though I just quit my job, I was going to school full time. I had an extra couple thousand dollars to toss in the market. But fast mm -hmm. forward, if I was still at my job in healthcare, would I have that thousand? And it was 2021, 2020, and the you know stupid 19 happened. Would I be able to take, or would I? not be able to because i would you know it's probably still be working at the same job or doing something mm. else same income but would i feel comfortable taking that money that fiat from my bank account that i could use to feed my child to pay my mortgage and tossing it into an extremely speculative asset it, it kind of brings me to to the point of a potential correction but before we go to a, to a correction because i do want because you talked about how the trends you know the macro trends and the consumer behavior behavioral economics are very different from 2017 where people have more money. But uh, just looking at the market cycle right now, obviously you, you know the psychology very well where you go from optimism to belief, to thrill, to euphoria, to complacency, and then boom, the market goes down. Do, are you a little bit worried uh, in terms of where we are in the market cycle? Do you see a correction for coming this year? And uh, yeah, please let us know your thoughts on that. It would be, would be great. Right now, because I, I went through 2017 bear market, I bought Bitcoin at the top. I think I bought a little, I bought some like at 7,000, 10,000, 13, 14, 17. So 17,000 was like the top. Market's different though. And the reason why it's different, we have a, people with a lot of money, more money than God coming in and buying Bitcoin. They care about their money. They don't want this thing to drop too much. So are we going to have another 50% drop with Bitcoin, 80% drop with Bitcoin now? Now that we've got millionaires and billionaires invested that have a lot of money and that can kind of control the market, will that happen? Or will we get the same type of price action? I'm not 100% sure. So that's why I kind of pay attention and I just kind of watch the market. I know just as long as Bitcoin stays over $20,000, I'm fine. I'm happy because majority of my Bitcoin holdings was per was purchased or acquired during before underneath um, $20,000, most of it under $10,000. Um, but I'm still kind of cautious. And I don't like, I'm not the type of person that likes to make these long-term predictions. Like we're going to have this drop, this is going to happen. Because realistically, you can draw whatever you want on a chart. Yeah. But the market doesn't care. The market and the economy don't really care about your your indicator, your mathematics. And it's kind of based on things that are kind of out of our control. So I may get some slack for that. People might be like, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But I'm actually more concerned with the psychology that's being put into it, how people are feeling, what consumers are spending their money on, um, you know, what's going to happen when the economy opens up. Because we don't know. We've never experienced anything like this in the United States, at least since I've been alive. So when the, mark when the economy opens up in the U.S., how is that going to impact people? Who's going to have jobs? Is the job industry changed? Like we don't really know the the real number of job reports. Like we don't know the real amount of foreclosures. Like just that type of stuff. So I'm like I'm just taking all of it in and I'm just kind of watching and observing and commenting on it when things when things become relevant. Super cool. Yeah, there's so many unknowns as you mentioned, right? That it's very very hard to try to imagine what's going to happen. And like you said, institutional adoption. You know, we had. By the way, it's really cool that your daughter got Bitcoin before Elon Musk. That's pretty cool. You know, that that's how she, that's that really shows that you know Bitcoin is the money of the people because we got yeah. in before these institutions and these hedge funds and all that stuff. But um, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense um, to me from every single angle. And would love to ask you: Are are there any like particular projects in DeFi or coins or tokens? that you see potential in, or, or it could be just an asset class or a sub asset class that you think has very, very strong potential coming in 2021, or maybe if, if 2021 is too short, maybe 2025, or what are, what are kind of some things that you really look forward to and think that could have a massive impact on the world? So I like, like obviously Bitcoin, I love Ethereum. However, we've got the scaling issue. Um, I, that's why I love Polkadot. I'm dollar cost averaging on Polkadot every week. Mm. Um, I've got a decent bag and I just keep buying more because I really believe in the interoperability of the project and just the, I just, I love it. And plus I like the name Polkadot. Um, but I think that is really <laughs> great. There's, you know, some DeFi projects. I like, I really like what Ferrum is doing. I like what YFDI is doing. Um, you know, there's a project called Gala Games. It's for gaming and NFTs. I like that time of, type of stuff. There's just, there's so, to me, there's just so many great projects out there. There's some that I'm more invested in than others. The thing with NFTs, like I've never made one. I've had, I bought like an action figure or a, a character from a project because I thought it was super cute. And I'll buy like a couple things here and there I think are cute. But when I think about NFTs, I don't think of, I like I have know a lot of friends that are artists and musicians and they're amazing. I support all creative aspects. I support entrepreneurs. But my mind goes a little bit deeper when I'm thinking about 
about NFTs. I'm thinking about putting healthcare, um, healthcare records on the blockchain, yeah. real estate records, that's type of stuff, stuff for DMV, yeah. but taking it a step further. I think that there's a subgroup that nobody's talking about. And I've mentioned it a couple of times, but you remember when you were a little kid, did you ever have a lemonade stand? Yeah, of course. Yeah. That was okay. the first time I made money. I made like 3.5 bucks. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about that. It was so exciting as a little kid for you to, oh, you know, amazing. make this lemonade, do everything, the ritual. I don't care if it was country time lemonade, whatever it was, or you would sell, I would sell artwork. We would do different things. Um, but cause we had no, no money growing up. But I think that there's a really great opportunity for kids, for parents, like parents that want to raise money for their kids' sports that can't afford it, for to have their kids create little art pieces or write poems or do different things like that. And kids in third world countries that may necessarily want to help instead of them having to go out and do manual labor, things that are dangerous, can yeah, there can be an organization that focuses on helping these kids create things, getting them set up with NFTs so they can earn additional income to their families and even adults that are struggling too. figure out how they can create things of value and other people can kind of don't. And that would be the way people would donate to help them via that. So I think NFT has a NFTs have a really, really amazing market. I just want to see it done for like good stuff. Like I'm not saying the other stuff is not good stuff, but I just, I have that vision in my head of seeing these kids making extra income or being able to pay for college or their cars or helping mom and down. That's that that's powerful. And that's something that I would like to see in the future. And I just like, I think of these things. I'm like, this is so freaking cool. Like this is an amazing world we live in that you can literally be somewhere, create something, Put it online and get paid for it and not have to like leave your house. Like how cool is that? Yeah, that is so cool. And as a matter of fact, today at a conference I was at, like uh, one of the panels ended with NFTs is the most underrated or yeah, underrated uh, projects in crypto. Because as you said, there's so many alternative digital identity. I mean, it, it, we can go on and on forever, but I love your message about it sounds like a universal basic income for all and, and some sort of like economy that is fully inclusive no matter the age right so that's yeah because uh, you magical. you don't know like of course you can put your bio out like oh i'm a five-year-old kid i'm using this but yeah. you know you don't necessarily have to do that you can be anonymous and no one m people might not know who you are but i think that there's i think there's so many there's so many opportunities for that type of stuff and like i just want to see like i want entrepreneurs like musicians and artists to do well but at the same time too i'm thinking of the underdogs and thinking about the people that no one is talking about nobody's advocating for nobody's even paying attention to because we're so excited about getting rich and number going up but there's people in the world that need help and that they just need a little bit of guidance heck even when i was growing up um i i got in a lot of trouble when i was a teen because i was just so depressed i'd lost my dad things are terrible i was in like really really weird relationships all kinds of stuff but it's like if i just had someone come in as like hey wendy you can do this. What a, look at this. Someone just came and talked to me, gave me an extra five minutes. My life could have been a little bit different. That's something that I think that we can kind of do that in our local communities and talk to people that we know and try to help. And I think NFTs could be, you know, they, it could be that. I don't know if it is, but I think I see opportunity there. Absolutely. And for those watching out there, if you believe NFTs are a really strong use case for the blockchain, don't forget to put it in the comments. If you have any ideas that haven't been mentioned, share it with us because the more we can talk about this, the more we can actually uh, learn from each other, which is absolutely amazing. Wendy, I wanted to tell you one thing, like, thank you so much for keeping it real today, for being open, you know, and, and not having the filters that, you know, sometimes people may have. You were completely unfiltered today, which which I really appreciate. Um, obviously, you're very active on Twitter and YouTube. Are those the two major platforms for those who want to get to know more about uh, Wendy? And by the way, you have some pretty good punches. I like that jab, jab, hook, hook combination. <laughs> yeah, no, I started boxing when I was 16 um, to defend myself because I had to growing up, unfortunately. Some crazy stuff, you know, I've had a bit of an interesting life, but I'm so glad that I learned how to box because um, boxing teaches you confidence. So during um, Stupid 19, I went ahead and I picked it up again. I'm kind of self-taught and I have a trainer now and, you know, in my old neighborhood and I do a lot of um, charitable stuff for that place. I love, love it there. But I'm on Twitter. I am on YouTube, but I'm like crazy on TikTok. I post a lot of content on TikTok. I know people are like, oh my God, cringy dances. I talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, mm. NFTs. I talk about all this stuff on TikTok. Um, if you want to get to know me better, you can follow me there. I'm very unfiltered. I say what I want to say. I will curse sometimes. Um, and I'll talk about my my experiences and whatnot. So if you want to learn, you can go ahead and check me out there. If you don't, that's fine too. Thank you so much, Wendy, for coming on the show, guys. 
If you like this realness, these timeless interviews, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and blast that bell notification so you get access to these amazing people, educators, trying to grow the space all together. Thank you so much, guys. See you every Wednesday, premiere at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. Take care, guys. What?